All right, hi everybody. I just wanted to start this lecture on um, free fall motion with the problem solving steps that we've been discussing. You'll notice that there's more than the five steps that I have discussed in class previous to today. Um, just wanted to make sure that you know they're all basically the same thing, right? So steps two and three, I can divide into one. Um, and don't forget that step six, there is a lot of information out there about how to determine if a result is unreasonable or not. Um, okay, so today's topic is going to involve um, incorporating gravity into our discussions on, kinem on kinematic motion in one dimension. And what we're going to do here is um, we're going to recognize a couple of things about some of the assumptions we're about to make. One of the major assumptions we're about to make is that while air resistance really does have an effect on the motion of objects, we are going to be pretending like it doesn't exist for right now. We will um, we will introduce how to correct for say air resistance by involving drag in um, future lectures and in future motions that we analyze. But for now and for the next couple of chapters, we are going to pretend like friction doesn't have a very defined effect on the motion that we're going to be analyzing. Um, so that being said, what we're going to actually be working with is called free fall motion. Um, you've heard the term free fall before. It's essentially the idea that an object is falling and there is nothing to act against that falling, so it's falling in free fall. Um, AKA, we're going to pretend like air resistance doesn't exist. Um, because we live on the planet Earth, we are going to assume that all objects will then fall um, with the um, acceleration of a constant due to gravity. And like I had told you guys earlier, um, next week in lab, we will be proving the gravitational constant because I believe it's important for you to actually see, A, um, practicing your um, creating lab skills, and B, I think it's important for you to realize that, yes, actually, um, when we do calculations in lab, a lot of times they will come out to be exactly what we think they should be. Um, so that being said, let's introduce the actual gravitational constant. On the planet Earth, that gravitational constant is a 9.81 meters per second squared. You will notice that um, sometimes your book wants you to uh, pretend like this is 10 meters per second squared. Um, you will see it abbreviated as 9.80 meters per second squared. I'm sorry, I'm writing a weird angle. Um, and so on and so forth, but just remember that whatever value of the constant you're using, um, it is still going to be somewhere in that range of that 9.81. I am pretty picky when it comes to things like this, so I will always type in 9.81 when I'm doing calculations. Um, one of the other things to notice is that because all objects are pulled towards the center of the planet, we identify the downward direction as where the acceleration is always pointing. Because it's down, um, a lot of times we have this urge to change the sign of g because, again, it's an acceleration. Um, we have this urge to change the sign of g to be negative. Um, and what I'm going to teach you here in a second involves changing the kinematic equations so that they have gravity involved as the acceleration piece. And already in these equations, gravity is taken into account as a negative acceleration. So just kind of be aware that this is where we're going um, with this particular topic. But depending on the motion that you are setting up, your gravity can either be positive or negative. Um, it really does depend on the coordinate system that you decide you're going to work with. So that being said, um, there are some assumptions we're going to make when we do these simple these are simple motion equations, right? What we're going to assume is one, that air resistance and friction are not a thing, that the initial velocity of any object before the object is dropped, um, that initial velocity will be zero. Again, we're talking about the specific situation of if I'm holding an object and I decide I'm going to drop it, that initial velocity is zero. We're going to assume that the acceleration is a constant 9.8, 9.81 meters per second squared, whichever you use is fine, um, and that the vertical displacement that we're going to be using is going to be um, indicated with a Y, so this is going to replace our X values. So instead of saying displacement in the X direction, um, we are going to say displacement in the Y direction. You'll also hear um, terms like height. So Y directions are sometimes referred to as heights. 
which is usually denoted by an H. On the contrary, we haven't really seen them yet, but the X direction will sometimes be referred to as ranges. And we will deal more with height and range in projectile motion, which is one of the next concepts that we will be covering. Okay, um, so for the free falling objects, there are three equations. You'll remember that there were five X equations. Oops. There were five X equations that we discussed um, for the first set of kinematics equations, and they were all of the ones that involved X motion. If you look closely, and I will rewrite them out here for you, the last three equations are gonna be the ones that you should recognize because they are all of the ones that have been replaced. Um, they have all been replaced with the y's. So if we take these equations and we replace them with y directions, you'll see that they all look uh, the same. Just give me one second to write these out. This one matches this one. Um, and then our final is that squared velocities. Oops. So again, if you take all of the variables and you replace the x's with y's and the a's with negative g's, you get these three new kinematic equations. So again, every rule we've discussed as far as how to do problems is still going to apply here, but instead we need to be recognizing if we are in the y direction or if we are using the x direction equations in any kind of motion. So still we have initial velocity, still we have initial time, or initial time is zero. Still we will have y and y not, which sometimes gets replaced just by height. Um, instead of having a subtraction. Um, again, some little nuances that we're gonna see, okay? Um, one of the things to know is that acceleration due to gravity, that constant that we just introduced, is dependent on location. So if we're at a very, very high altitude, our gravitational constant is slightly different than if we're at sea level. Just kind of realizing that that is what um, the accepted norm is. Also, for the most part, we're talking, you know, maybe at the top of Mount Everest that it's, you know, 9.79 and at sea level it's 9.81. It's, it's a very small, negligible thing. So if we start throwing objects in um, very high altitudes, then maybe we need to adjust our physics expectations. But for now, um, our assumptions are all going to work. Um, so here we have an object that is being dropped and how far it goes, in how long, and at what speed it's traveling at an any instant, at this instant in time, has been tracked. Um, one of the things that you're asked to do is to make graphs of position time, velocity time, and acceleration versus time. So looking at what we were doing in class this last week, or on Tuesday, we were doing position. In this case, it's actually going to be y and time on the x and we start with a zero position and we end up going negative and what ends up happening over time is going to be a curve that looks something like this okay if we then take this graph and we do a velocity time graph we're going to take those velocities that we're getting and we're going to plot them and you'll notice that with every 0.1 seconds that our velocity goes up by a very predictable interval almost exactly one meter per second so again our velocity is going to be starting at zero and it's negative because it's falling downward um, from there if we look at the acceleration time graph a our velocity is negative so our slope is negative if our slope is a constant negative value, then it looks like a straight line on the acceleration time graph. So stay, uh, stay fresh on these graphs because these are always something that people tend to get tripped up with in this class. 
So if you can move from one to the other, you're probably in good shape. Um, at least at this point, I would expect that you could take a position time graph and get a velocity time graph. Maybe we still need a little more practice moving from our velocity time to our acceleration time, and that's okay. All right, so here we have another equation or another problem that we're going to set up. I will always try to write my three equations before I get started so that I have them ready to go. Whoops, sorry. Technical difficulties. My y equation. You'll notice my signs are changing in these equations. You'll also notice fewer equations, like we said. All right, so it says a person standing on the edge of a high cliff. So again, I'm going to start with my drawing. My person on the cliff takes an object and throws it straight up. Okay, his initial velocity. So remember, one of the things I like to do is identify my variables is 13 meters per second. It says the rock misses the edge of the cliff. So when he throws it up, he actually ended up having his hand slightly over, throws it up, comes back down. Okay, the rock misses the edge of the cliff as it falls back to earth. Um, the first thing says to calculate the position and velocity of the rock at one, two, and three seconds after it is thrown. Neglecting air resistance, it may be helpful to make a table. Um, if my initial velocity is always going to be 13 meters per second, and this is a free fall situation, then we all need to remember that A will be equal to G in this case. We do not have to worry about the sign because, again, the signs are already accounted for. Okay, so we do not need to change signs. All right, um, A is always going to be G. Looks like time is going to be one, two, or three seconds. Um, in this case, I know that my initial Y, again, we said we could talk, we talked about setting our own coordinate plane. Excuse my dog. <laughs> um, we set our initial Y to be zero. One of the things we're, act, we're asked to identify is position and velocity at these different times. So I know that I'm going to be solving for y, and I know I'm going to be solving for my final v for these two times. So let's go ahead and let's set up our table. I'm going to do it up here. I'm going to put my time here. I'm going to do y, and I'm going to do v. And I apologize if my graph is not pretty. I am doing this on a tablet, so, you know, bear with me. Um, so since I have all of these things and I know that one of my goals is to figure out the, oops, sorry, these are just one, two, and three seconds. One of my goals is to figure out why. I'm going to look at my equations over here, and I'm going to notice that I do have t, and I have initial v, and I know what g is. I know that equation one will find me v. So if I use equation one, I'm going to get my velocities for each of these different time points. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. I'm looking for an equation that'll let me use, that I can use that'll get me y though. And it looks like equation two is probably an option. I don't know final velocities. So in number three, if I use that, I end up with two variables. I've got a y and I've got a velocity. Now, if I solve for velocity in number one first, and then I want to use number three, I can do that. Or I can just use equations one and two. However you want to solve the problems are again up to you as usual. So I'm going to use equation one to get v. And I'm going to do this at t equals one second first. Oops. My brain is still tuned into the x. Setting this up. Um, my time was one second. I'm going to get v equals 13 minus 9.81, um, which is... 3.19 meters per second. So now I know my first value, okay? 
Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use equation two. Wait one second. I'm going to erase this. You can always pause things and go back and all that lovely stuff. Um, my equation two is going to give me, or I'm sorry, to get y if t is 1, y initial is 0, I'm going to get 13 times 1 plus 1 half, oops, yes. One half of four nine point eight times one squared. So I'm gonna do thirteen minus four point nine. Oops, sorry, nine point eight one nine zero five. If you want to be technical, I'm trying to do this in my head because I don't have my calculator out. Always have your calculator with you. If I've taught you anything, you should know that. Eight point zero nine five meters. And it looks like my object is going up from its initial point. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pause and I'm going to solve for the rest of these. Um, you should be able to do this on your own. You just basically repeat the process at every time point, two and three. Um, and then I will restart my video once I have those in my table. All right, so now you can see my table here on the top of the screen. I've gone through and I have calculated all of my different time points and their velocities and their um, distances. And I'm sure as you were solving some of these, if you tried this on your own, you probably noticed that some of your numbers started to kind of look a little wonky. If you aren't thinking about the overall motion, what we're actually doing is down here. I took our little diagram that we initially drew and I drew it in better detail so that you could see um, what is going on in the course of this motion. So our first part of our throw, he throws the thing up or she throws it up um, and at about eight meters above the initial throwing point, that's where we're at at one second. We're at about, we're above the initial um, axes that we threw. So we're in the positive Y. We're moving at a positive velocity, but we're moving at a slower positive velocity than what we started with. If you recall, our instant um, initial velocity was 13 meters per second. So as this object went up, gravity is of course acting in the opposite direction of its movement and slows it down um, by a few meters per second. Then you'll notice that at time two, our velocity has now turned negative. What we've done is we've moved over the period of where velocity is zero, which is at the top of the path of movement, and now we're moving back downward. So our velocity is now pointing downward, which means it's negative, but our y velocity or our y position is still above where we started. So we're still somewhere above where we started, but we're on the other side of the motion because our velocity has changed direction. And last but certainly not least, at our final time point, both our velocity is negative and it's gotten more negative and our position is now below our initial horizontal axes that we defined as zero. So just kind of understanding, here's where we're at with what's going on. The next thing to do is to create some position time, velocity time and acceleration time graphs. I'm gonna let you do this on your own. I'd like to see this in the notes that you turn in. Um, with the um, with this lecture video. So again, this is question one on the practice problems that are in this lecture video. Um, next is going to be a question that says, what happens if the person on the cliff throws the rock straight down instead of straight up? So here's my person on my cliff. Here's his rock. His initial velocity in the previous situation was positive, okay? What now happens if we start this velocity negative okay and the question is to figure out all right 
What is the velocity when it is 5.1 meters below its starting point and has been thrown downward with an initial, this is supposed to say velocity, of 13 meters per second? Now, initial velocity downward means what? It means negative velocity. So our V naught now becomes negative 13. Our V final, we don't know. Um, but that is what we're trying to find. We know our initial y was going to be set at 0. We know our final y was going to be 5.10 meters below where we were starting. And we know that this y velocity is never going to, or this y position will never be above 0. So just kind of realizing that the position time graph that we are looking at is going to start at 0 and move downward. However that looks, it doesn't matter. Just understand that it does not go up. Whereas the position time graph of the previous one probably went up and then came down. All right. Um, so that being said, here's where we're at. We know G is 9.8 meters per second squared, which is equal to A. Um, we don't know time, which might be a problem for us, especially if we don't, um, when we look at these equations. I'm going to look at my different equations, remind you of what they are. You will never write them too many times. Um, even though I've been teaching this for many years now, it is always useful to remind yourself of what the equations are. Um, remember that anytime I give you an assessment of any kind, I would give you these equations and I would give you the x direction and y direction equations for sure. I just would not label them as this is the x direction, this is the y direction. Apologies wrong. So since I don't have time, but I do have everything else, I'm thinking I'm going to have to use equation three. Equation three takes into account the velocities. I want to find that final velocity. Remember that with equation three, we were warned that we had to watch our signs. Okay. So just don't forget that you have to watch your signs when you use this one to solve. I'm going to erase the diagram so that I can have some room. I'm write my equations. Again, please ignore my dog. She is just being a little bit of a booty tonight. Oh, my initial velocity is the thing we don't know. This guy's negative 13. And times negative 5.0. Minus zero, so negative. It's gonna flip the sign. Oy vey. This one is kind of intense. So I've got this happening. <coughs> Here's where I'm at. Taking the square root, I'm getting sixteen point four meters per second. Now, hopefully, you realize that this is wrong the way that I've written it because it does say that the velocity of the rock when it's 5.1 meter below is going to be pointing in the straight down direction, which means our velocity since it started negative, never went up, is probably also going to have to be negative. And after only maybe five meters, if you're supposed to gain um, 10 meters per second-ish in um, velocity every, t every second you're in motion, then negative 16 does track um, compared to negative 13. So this answer does in fact make sense. All right, I think that that is where I am going to stop this video. Please remember that you do have other things you need to be working on during class today. Um, after you are done with this video, start working on the practice problems over 2.7 that are posted. Remember to follow the steps of the problem solving method. I want to see pictures. I want to see identified unknowns. I want to see um, equations you plan to use. And I do want to see that you are addressing whether or not it does make sense. And then there is also a set of practice problems posted for your quiz. 
which will be next Tuesday, the first part of class. And the second part of class will be designing an experiment to prove that gravitational constant. All right, have a great night or class. See you later. Bye.